I have Alyssa's here with me as well. So she's gonna be helping to monitor the chat. And a few of our Charette committee members are going to um, speak later on um, in the slides. So uh, I'll have them introduce themselves as they pop on. Um, my name's Tiffany Tononi McNamara. I'm the director here at Plan New Hampshire. And this webinar is very specific to um, our community design Charette program. So we've had a lot of interest. A lot of times people just contact us individually to ask questions, which we're always happy to answer and have conversations. Um, but it came up this year that there might be a benefit to having, you know, a one-stop shop for people who are interested. And so that's what this is meant to be. Uh, we're going to really gear this towards um, two audiences, which are people who might be interested in volunteering in the future, and then communities that might be interested in applying to the program in the future. Um, so I want to start by thanking our sponsors. So Make Architects and Wright Pierce um, have both stepped up to sponsor this event. Thank you both so much. They've also been a part of several charrette teams in the past um, and are a great value to a team. So if you do host a charrette and you see someone from Make or Wright Pierce on the team, um, you've, you've got a good team. I mean, all the teams are good, but they, they bring a lot of value. It's, it's great. And a quick shout out to our members. We are a member-based organization. Um, we have over 80 members, mostly firms and organizations and municipalities from across the community development spectrum. These are our platinum and gold members who really go above and beyond to financially support us throughout the year, as well as um, support our events and volunteer their time on committees and our board. So very grateful to them. And this is our agenda for um, our lunch hour. Also, please feel free to be eating while we're talking. Um, I don't want anyone going hungry. So we're just going to real briefly introduce who Plan is. Most of you, I think, I looked at the registration list. So I think most of you are pretty aware of us. But um, we always like to do that just in case we have some new folks. What is a charrette if it is a new term for you? And then overview of our actual program at Plan New Hampshire. We're not the only organization that has charrettes. So what is our program all about? We're going to talk about a few recent examples of charrettes, some of the benefits, um, both for communities and volunteers. And we're going to briefly discuss what the application is like for people who might be interested. And of course, taking Q&A, please feel free to put your questions or comments into the chat while we're talking. Um, and we'll either hold those things or Alyssa, if you notice something that would just be easier to answer while we're going, please like chime in and let me know. So Plan New Hampshire, we are a 501c3 organization founded in 1989 by a group of architects who are very involved in AIA, but we're looking for sort of another venue that was a little more interdisciplinary. So we became um, an organization of engineers, architects, planners, folks from across the community development spectrum who care about our mission, which is to foster excellence in planning, design, and development of New Hampshire's built environment. And um, the Charette program is really one of our signature programs. Um, it didn't start in the very beginning, but being founded by architects meant that it, it happened pretty soon thereafter, because Charettes are a pretty common um, practice in, in architecture. So what is a Charette? We always do that. When we go to communities, we talk about this too, because sometimes it's just the jargon throws people off. But um, feel free to chime in if anyone knows more about charrettes. But just generally speaking, it's a French word that literally means cart. And so this picture in the bottom corner is um, showing like early architecture students like throwing all their work in the cart and getting it to their exhibition for critique and stuff. And so similarly, um, you know, a charrette is often a meeting where everything's kind of being thrown in the cart. Like what is the problem we're looking to, um, the challenge we're looking to resolve or to create recommendations around and then having that two, three day like intensive um, process to really brainstorm around it and map out possible solutions. And all the photos in these slides are from our recent charrette. So um, you'll notice like the captions next to them. Um, so for our program, our first charrette that was documented was in 1996. I believe that we dabbled in charrettes before that, but at the time 
there wasn't necessarily a thought it was going to become a program, and then it did. So Belmont was our first charrette in 1996. Um, at that time, it was really looking at the Belmont Mill and their village center there. And since then, we've had over 78 charrettes and sometimes in communities more than once. So this map, um, which is also on our website, shows the 66 plus communities that have had a planned New Hampshire charrette and the green um, dots show communities that have had two or even three charrettes, which um, most of those reports are available on our website. And a lot of times when you've had two or three charrettes, even just with Plan New Hampshire, they might have done other processes with other organizations. It's really an indicator of a community who's uh, really focused on solutions and dealing with their challenges and really just looking forward. Um, so a lot of times that second, third charrette are really building off of the first because they've had so much success. Our program at PLAN is first and foremost, a response to an application from typically a municipality. Um, so we don't just come and bring our program. We don't impose our program. Um, we are really invited in. So it's a response to that invitation. And then it, as most charrettes are, it's a listening and brainstorming session grounded in planning and design, but focused on the built environment. Um, and for us, it's a two day exercise. So some charrettes look different than that, but ours is two days. We look at the target area, meet with stakeholders. We have community input sessions during that time. Um, and an example itinerary is right here. So we're always working on a Friday and a Saturday. And for our team, they can be two pretty intense days because, you know, a lot of times people, we don't love working till 8.30 p.m. on Friday. Um, but for a charrette, there's so much like energy and creativity happening. It's a very exciting two days, I would say. Um, and then we come back that second day and that's when we're really doing all of the crafting of the recommendations um, and actually presenting those recommendations on the spot. So everything that we end up presenting is created in real time during this two-day process. Our teams are made up of volunteers. So other than myself or Alyssa, who were staff members here at Plan New Hampshire, everyone is volunteering their time to be on the Charette teams. We're typically talking about 12 to 18 team members, depending on the challenge that we are there to uh, focus on. And it's always a cross section of folks. Um, you know, we, we try to make sure the team has the right professions and expertise to meet the specific challenge, but there's a lot of like common fields that would be represented. So we're almost always gonna have engineers, um, architects, landscape architects. Sometimes we'll have historic preservationists or planners. Uh, we might have, we might need an engineer with a specific, um, environmental focus or something like that. So we always work with the community to make sure we have the right specialists on the team. And our volunteers are very passionate folks. They're very enthusiastic about the process, about giving back to the state of New Hampshire. Um, and they're very skilled in their field. A lot of times we're, you know, it might be principals, someone who's a principal at a company now, a firm who their day to day, they're not getting to just get as creative as you get to be in a charrette. And so it can be um, just a really fun process. And it's people from all different organizations who in the real world might be in competition with one another if there was like a bid process or an RFP or something. But at a charrette, we're all working cooperatively. Um, and our teams are not only made up of Plan New Hampshire members, but it is a big benefit of our membership. A lot of our members really enjoy being a part of this program. So they receive priority invitation to participate in a team. And once, um, once we've kind of filled out the team from there, we reach out further. Um, or we have key partners who sometimes aren't necessarily a member, um, but for example, Department of Transportation, like they're not in our membership per se, but they're a key partner, especially on the Charette program. And so we often will have a team member from DOT. So I know I kept mentioning recommendations. Um, these are sketches, uh, mock-ups, different, um, different types of recommendations that were made at recent uh, recent charrettes. So these recommendations and visuals are created on the spot during those two days and presented in real time. Um, not every recommendation is visual, of course, um, but I do think that is a big part of the charrettes. But we'll also have folks coming up with maybe funding ideas or um, economic development 
ideas that would be more bullet points or narrative form. Um, and all of these things will be presented that second day, that Saturday, but also in a final report. So um, we, we present everything in slide formats uh, during the shred and 10 to 12 weeks later, we provide an actual, now it's a PDF document, um, it used to be like spiral bound reports, um, but we provide that to the host community and we add it to our online library, which has over 60 of our reports are on our online library. If people are interested in looking at whether or not your community's had a charrette or just interested in seeing how things have changed since 1996, um, even in the font landscape. <laughs> so these are a few of the covers of our recent charrettes uh, here on the right side of the slide. So that those are really the basics of the program, but we want to talk more about some examples and then really dive a little bit more into the benefits and what the application looks like and answer questions from people who might be interested in volunteering or interested in applying. So um, these are some recent communities uh, in the last handful of years that we've worked in. And um, I'm going to have Brian Pratt introduce himself, and he's going to talk about the first two, Littleton and Campton. Great. Uh, thanks, Tiffany. Nice job. Um, so first of all, I'm Brian Pratt. I'm a civil engineer with Fuss and O'Neill. I'm also a board of directors member with uh, Plan New Hampshire, and I'm on the Shark Committee. And over the past five years, I've participated in five mm -hmm. charrettes, and I've led or co-led four of them. I really love the charrette program. That's why I got involved with Plan New Hampshire. It really helps me uh, get creative and do stuff that I wouldn't normally do in my everyday job. So it's it's great networking and really great to help the communities. The, uh, the program is, is awesome, and it's really uh, help these communities um, really improve their their downtowns. Um, the first one uh, is uh, Littleton that I participated in 2019. Um, we had previously done a, a charrette in uh, 2012, and that the purpose of that charrette was to improve their riverfront district. Um, when we got there in 2019, the the community had already com um, completed a number of those other improvements, so they invited us back to really expand that. Um, that area. So the focus um, was primarily on a seven acre parcel um, and it was on the opposite side of the river from the riverfront district. Um, it was a piece of land that was privately owned, but the town was trying to purchase. Uh, they had started to use it for some things, some farmer's market, but it was really kind of um, disjointed and they really needed to get some um, public feedback to figure out what people really wanted to see there and um, really just get them going in the right direction. So they um, invited us in, they applied for the program. Uh, and as Tiffany mentioned, the first day is just like a stakeholder and public outreach session. So we had a really great um, turnout. We had a lot of stakeholders, a lot of excitement, a lot of people from the public came and we got some really great uh, ideas on what we should do with that. Um, the next day, as Tiffany mentioned, is just a working session. So we worked um, and we came up with this sketch here on the left. That's the uh, that's the seven acre parcel. So that really um, focused on how can, how they can efficiently use that piece of land. And um, we came up with this plan for um, like a multi use park. Basically, they can use it for farmers markets and amphitheater. Uh, there's a welcome center proposed there. Um, we plan to relocate some parking to, to really uh, efficiently use that. Uh, expand the river walk, um, lighting improvements. And then there were also a number of other um, pieces of the um, the town that they wanted to talk about. So there were, I think, three or four other parcels. We also learned about uh, there was some rail trail improvements that had recently been added to the 10-year plan. So we incorporated rail trail recommendations. We um, incorporated recommendations on three or four other parcels. And um, we came up with some great ideas for other potential uses uh, one was a dog park, some housing projects, uh, some trails, and other um, just uh, various redevelopments. Uh, I caught up with um, people from Littleton, and the good news is they're actually working on executing this pro uh, this plan right now. They put this park um, project out to bid. They received um, applicants, and they um, had it designed, permitted, and it's going to construction, I believe, this year. Uh, there's another large property that they talked about. We had some recommendations to redevelop. It was actually purchased by a private developer and they're uh, undergoing the redevelopment for a mixed use. Um, and then they have completed the rail trail. So 
they've uh, successfully completed the 2012 um, charrette and also they're making really good progress on the 2019. Could you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> the other one was just last year, it was in Campton, New Hampshire. And they invited us to town to uh, really try to help them um, make their, they have some scattered various um, kind of town centers. One they called the Upper Village and one they called the Gateway Area. Uh, the Upper Village is by the Campton Dam. I don't know if anyone knows where that is. And then the, the Gateway Area is just off exit 28 off of Interstate 93. Um, the problem is they these aren't really places. They're just kind of people would zoom right through. So the focus of our charrette was really to try to slow people down, make a, a wel welcoming area and kind of create some downtowns. Um, there are also goals on uh, providing some connectivity through the town. So again, we had a really good turnout. The town, just like Littleton, they were really proud of their community. Uh, the stakeholders came, we had great um, recommendations from the public. And um, we came up with some awesome plans. The, the plan on the bottom here is um, proposed to uh, put a roundabout in that upper village by the dam. Um, and we have like 3D sketches that kind of show what it's gonna look like before and after. By the uh, gateway area, we actually proposed two roundabouts. And as Tiffany mentioned, we had people from the DOT with us to try to help and prove that it, you know these could be real, um, real improvements. Uh, so we came up with some awesome options. Um, there are also some other parcels of land right in that gateway area that we came up with different sketches for library, community center, and other just private mixed uses. Uh, so the report really um, gave the town some good direction. Um, my uh, understanding is that they have actually set aside some money to do some design funding and try to get some more grants and try to get onto the 10-year DOT plan for some of these improvements. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Brian. Um, I am going to talk real quickly about Temple, which we did um, in 2022. Uh, and Temple's focus was really on a couple different things. Um, housing was a, a huge portion of their focus. And then also um, possible relocation of a DPW yard, which was, to me, surprisingly controversial. <laughs> Um, when something's more controversial than housing, you know, it's like, wow, uh, it takes you by surprise. Um, but what I wanted to include in here were some of the recommendations related to housing, because I thought they were a great example um, of how we really try to listen to the community and to craft recommendations that make sense based on what we're hearing, you know, the needs are, but also like some of the anxieties and fears. So there was mostly consensus that they had a housing issue, they need housing, their teachers can't afford to live in the community, you know, a lot of the things we hear um, in many communities in New Hampshire. But there was like a tension between wanting to preserve their rural character, wanting to um, maintain the open parcels that they did have for conservation land and a fear that more housing would basically remove all of that. So. Um, a couple things that our team came up with um, in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see like a large parcel with kind of the green stripes going across it. That is a big potential conservation um, area. And that was one of the tension of are we going to lose all of this to housing? And so our group really started um, coming up with some recommendations more around small cluster uh, neighborhood clusters and trying to show that you know, not everyone wants to live right next door to their neighbors, but a lot of people do like that and do want um, that community feel outside of their door. And if this is something Temple wanted to take on, they would be able to maintain, you know, nearly 85% of that parcel for conservation purposes. Um, and so we showed like some trails and there's a few other types of sketches that we provided as well, showing what that could look like. So that was one example of how our team tried to really you know, hear and listen and then bring their professional expertise to the table. Um, and then on the left side, I really liked this. Um, this was from Chris Kennedy at Make Architects, but he was, they, he was really trying to point out um, one way to preserve rural character. And that is that Temple has a lot of the um, big house, little house, back house, barn style um, homes around their community that really gives you that rural New England feel. And so he was talking about how in some places people have been able to convert these into 
maybe three to six units, depending on how large the property is. And so visually, you're still maintaining that character and that form that everyone really connects to, but you're able to add some gentle density. Um, and there could even be a way in which you could build new, but using that, uh, that same, um, that same look and feel the big house, little house, back house, barn. And so he was kind of, he showed a few different mock-ups of what that could look like. And, you know, will Temple do these things? You know, it's hard to say because it's only two years ago and we know these projects take a long time, but there was a lot of, um, the community really resonated with the recommendations and specifically even told us they really felt that they had been like heard um, in terms of the things they were worried about. And so I was really proud of that that team because housing is a hard topic to um, talk about uh, with communities. And so I wanted to highlight that um, from the temple, the temple charrette. And I'm going to actually have another committee member, Jamie Simchik, introduce himself and talk about Brentwood where we were last um, spring, I think it was. Yeah, thanks, Tiffany. Um, my name is Jamie Simchik. I'm on the Plain New Hampshire board and on the charrette committee um, and been on and led a, a handful of these charrettes. Um, this one was by far probably one of the most interesting ones I've done in a while. Um, very rarely do you get to deal with the sport of cricket and bow hunting in a charrette. And I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, the general premise was that Brentwood has this wonderful rec facility and they wanted to do something with it. And I think what, what really intrigued me too is uh, there were a lot of groups outside of Brentwood that it had asked to use it, um, soccer clubs, other other schools, and they were looking at ways to actually maybe monetize that and, and make it revenue generating. And so I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting and, and we had an awesome team and it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, as I said, it, it probably by by showcasing this shows kind of the breadth of what Plan New Hampshire can can work with municipalities on. As this wasn't your typical you know town center or um, corridor, um, and uh, what I also liked about this charrette, which was probably not the first, but you know one of the few where we had a number of UNH students participate, which I thought was great to expose them to this kind of level of engagement. Um, you know while they're still going through school. Um, the things that we we explored, um, realigning the fields, as I said, one of them was to do with the fact that how could they accommodate a, a growing cricket uh, playing community, um, adding lighting um, so that they could extend the hours of the day that, um, that the fields were used for. Um, also adding, as you can see in the bottom left of the slide, adding an indoor facility and, and really making this a community center as well, um, in addition to a sort of indoor, you know, sports facility. Uh, and you can, you, you may not have seen the before pictures, but there was two big things that came up. One, parking, um, always the case, but I think it's a victim of its own success. So there was some more parking added and also the stretch of road that it's on. Um, cars drive pretty fast. So there was a lot of talk about adding a roundabout, a new access point um, and and uh, parking and and kind of reducing the, the, the driving in and amongst, you know, kids playing in the fields and stuff like that. And then on a more broader basis, um, there's a very uh, robust bow hunting club that also has competitions. So we, um, we, we made sure to preserve that and then linked it to a larger regional um, trail system that you're, you're just not seeing. But um, as I can say, it was a, it was a great project. It was really fun and it, it was fun and it was different. And, um, you know, it was, it was really nice to be invited in to help participate on this project. That's all I got, Tiffany. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think it's a good time for me to mention, because I don't think I did, that with our program, typically we are looking at like a target area. So that might be um, a village center needing to be revitalized. It might be like in Brentwood where they don't really have a village center, but they had this rec area and felt like it could function more like a village center for residents. Um, so we're not usually looking at one specific building. Um, in the past, that might have been the case, or there might be a rare time where we're working with like a nonprofit or something. But I do think that is a big aspect of our program um, that's important to point out. Um, 
a few quotes from some communities because I love hearing from them themselves. Um, and we we did have someone who was going to be here to speak from a community, but she had a conflict come up. So um, we'll have to just be okay with quotes. So <laughs> um, Rye, we worked there in 2019, and they talked about how the most memorable part was having so many engaged, especially in the small group sessions. So the small group sessions tend to be very productive. You know, it's not a public meeting where um, people are just potentially coming to disrupt things or things like that. So Rye really felt that way afterwards. They liked how engaged the community was. Bristol talked about um, just helping have more focus and enthusiasm from the charrette. So they had a lot of like momentum post charrette. And they're one of the communities that's had multiple charrettes. Um, and then in Kingston, they talked about the team. So the knowledge of the Charette team and the enthusiastic participation of the residents is a wonderful memory that lingers with me. People care and do participate. Um, so I think for a lot of folks, you know, a lot of communities end up having that small group of people who feel like they do everything. Um, and maybe they are the people who do everything, but it can get exhausting. Burnout is real, you know, and so a lot of communities have been able to use this program or programs like this to get more people involved and to really like build the momentum so everything's not falling onto those same four or five people who like want to take a vacation once in a while. <laughs> um, we do have a small video that I'm going to show. It's only one minute, so don't worry. Um, but since someone couldn't be here in person to talk about their community, we are going to hear from someone about Littleton, which is the community Brian Pratt discussed, but really from their perspective as the community hosts. Hi, I'm John Hennessy in Littleton, New Hampshire. I work at Littleton Coin Company, but I got involved with Plan New Hampshire as a volunteer for the town of Littleton's River District Redevelopment Commission. Littleton was looking to revitalize our old mill district right in downtown, and we worked with Plan New Hampshire on a charrette. What I really liked most is that Plan New Hampshire creates the vision from input of our actual community members to make sure that the project's what the community really wants. And since the charrette, uh, we've used that vision to raise $5 million to invest in downtown Littleton, and that project's nearly complete now. And in fact, we felt so positive, we invited Plan New Hampshire back for another charrette. We created a vision for a seven-acre park along the river in downtown Littleton, and we've actually gone ahead and now purchased that land, and that project will be complete next year. So Plan New Hampshire has really helped us get both of these major projects off the ground. And it's been a really big benefit for our community. Thank you. Um, but that's a good segue because next I was going to introduce introduce North Sturdivant, who's from our board of directors and our Charette committee, to talk more about like the benefits to host communities as well as volunteers. So thanks, Tiffany. Um, I'm North Sturtev and I'm with JSA Architects in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, I have led a number of charrettes at this point. Um, I've lost count. Uh, I will be leading one in Sunapee um, in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I did notice in the, the chat, I know um, Alyssa has been monitoring that, but there was some questions about um, the engagement of the community uh, the who the stakeholders are and how we gather our information. So I think that um, that actually ties in pretty well to the benefits for host uh, communities. One of the things that happens a lot um, and and basically, you know, we go into our uh, into the to the today responding to um, an application. Typically, a group of us identify. Um, a team pretty early on, and we have some initial meetings with uh, the applicant to get a sense of the lay of the land and um, have an overall sense of what the application is about. That typically does include um, a visit to the to the site. Um, when we get to the formal um, uh, engagement process on Friday, the stakeholders are generally people who are involved in, um, they're the men and women behind the curtain in running their communities. So it'll be police and fire 
um, it'll be town uh, administrators, it'll be the town planner, it'll be anybody that really um, has to do with the operational side of the community, as well as leaders that um, have been identified as being important voices um, in the process. So um, uh, followed that by uh, our community stakeholder meetings and there it's about engagement. So um, we don't try to do a lot of prep because um, we want to come in uh, really as independent uh, additional sets of eyes uh, to these communities. So that's where the energy comes in. That's where the, the volunteers, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm now a member of about 15 communities in this state. You really get bought into it. How are you? Tied into it. Um, I'm great, whoever that was. <laughs> um, there are tons of professional development credits um, that are available either through the AIA, the ASLA, uh, engineering and so forth. Some of them are self-reported. Others are handled through our, um, our uh, being uh, approved uh, providers. I think, uh, and then of course there's the networking. It's a lot of fun. We get to know people that sometimes we wouldn't have gotten to meet um, before. Um, it really is um, an invigorating and exciting process for the benefit for the uh, volunteers. North, uh, that, um, can I ask you, I know we're like, we're going to do some Q&A at the end, but I see a question here about if we've worked in dif um, divisive communities. communities. Yes. Yeah. And uh, which I know the answer yeah. is yes, but yeah. I was wondering right. if you want to um, respond to that while we're talking about kind of the benefits for communities. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, we, we do find ourselves uh, sometimes uh, dealing with that. The, um, the World Cafe approach that we take when we do our listening sessions really makes sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. And um, our teams facilitate those conversations. So no one's really permitted to dominate um, the conversations. There are always going to be, uh, you know, the one or two individuals that that are not necessarily representing um, the entire community, and um, we, you know, want to make sure that they feel like they've been listened to. Um, so it's not like a, you know, shut up and get out. We're not bringing, you know, cops in and hauling them out in irons um, in chains. It's um, they are members of a community. Uh, if they are there with a divisive message, we try to redirect that and towards uh, really focusing on what the larger group is interested in. And um, uh, yeah, is that? Yeah, no, I think that's great. Um, and we can definitely talk more about, like we'll try to hit all these questions when we get to the Q and A. Um, so if we didn't answer your question yet, don't, don't feel anxious. We're, we're going to try. Thank you, North. Yep, um, thank you. really quickly on the application. So this is more for people who might be interested in, um, or well, for volunteers, people who are interested in volunteering, we do have an interest form. Um, there's a link to it in the slides, but I will share that after this presentation as well. So if you haven't volunteered before or haven't in a while and are interested and um, you can fill that out and let us know so that we can kind of have that list of folks that we know we can go to. For communities who are looking to apply, um, there's also a link here, but I will provide it afterwards to our application packet. Uh, there is a program fee. It's $6,500. And I believe someone, um, Rick had asked about um, people volunteering versus being paid. Um, so vast majority of our team are volunteers we do have uh, we do pay a report writer because that takes so much time after the two days but most of our team members really look at this as a, a point of service their firms support their day off typically um, so it's kind of a service piece giving back and also the CEUs um, are something that people look for we're, we're usually approved for 14 um, professional development credits by AIA and APA and several other um, professions are able to use that like equivalency. So it's pretty significant. Um, and we have before tried to 
estimate the value we bring. It really depends on the challenge and the team. Every team is different, but we have um, at one point we estimated somewhere between $25,000 and $80,000 worth of professional expertise being brought to the community in those two days. Um, again, it, it's, it's hard to put an exact dollar to it, but we do try to make sure we're bringing a lot of value to the community. Um, the community is also responsible for any expenses that might there might be in promoting the charrette that might be nothing or it could be something sometimes communities send a postcard out to every house um, some are very digital they have very active facebook groups or a newsletter that everybody reads and they know that that's how they're doing it they put the sandwich board out um, at all of their events so um, but any of those expenses would be on the community's end any expenses that might exist for planning and hosting and then keeping the team fed and caffeinated, I always add. Um, and, and also our team members often need lodging Friday night. Um, if we're driving more than an, depending on where we're going, right? If people are driving more than an hour, pretty much, it's it's very challenging if we're leaving at 8.30 p.m. and coming back at 8.30 a.m. Um, so that is something we work with, um, with the local community on how many team members might need that. In terms of how communities fund um, being able to do this process. I mean, we've heard all kinds of things. Some like Brentwood just had an appropriation for the program fee as well as all the extra expenses. And it went through um, town warrant very easily. You know, that's not the case for every community. Either the funds aren't there or, or it's more controversial to use um, tax dollars. So some communities have done private fundraising with local businesses who see a lot of value um, with the charrette taking place. And some have used grants. Um, Temple, for example, had a mini grant from New Hampshire Housing um, because their, their process was so housing focused. And um, so that's an option if housing is a part of what a community is looking at. So those are just some, some ideas. Um, the application itself is fairly simple, I would say. Um, there's a cover page, so we know who you are, where you're coming from, when was your master plan last updated. Um, we have five questions we ask for a response to, which I, I can go over here, but um, just I'll move on for right now. But we ask for a map of the project area so we know what we're talking about and we're not inferring incorrectly from the area being like described. Um, and letters of support. And so the letters of support, when uh, when we we're talking about divisive communities, so the letters of support doesn't have to mean every single person is a, in agreement about what should happen or that people are agreeing that all these recommendations are going to be implemented. No. But the letters of support help us know that leadership, you know, the important boards or council, select board, um, planning board are are really in consensus about the process, that they're very interested in the process happening and in respecting the process and in being open-minded to the recommendations. So it's not any kind of, you know, we're not, we're not forcing anyone to implement anything, <laughs> um, but we like to see that the leadership is is open to what's taking place and not too divisive amongst each other. There might be a board that's really interested, a heritage committee or someone who really wants to bring us in, but if the select board is just like, no way, um, then it's probably not the right time. And there's probably needs to be more like upfront work done in the community before it would make sense. Um, and lastly, we really recommend people apply at least four months prior to um, your charrette dates. But honestly, a lot of times a year out is even better. We can only um, do two to three a year. And so just for example, in the off chance that everybody wants to do this in August, right? Or September, that's not possible. So that's where we do try to make sure that people give us a lot of lead time so that we can be as accommodating as possible to what works for the community. Um, very few communities want a midwinter, a midwinter charrette, right? Or sometimes communities with a big visitor population in the summer, they don't necessarily want to do it during that time. They want to do fall or spring. Um, so that's just some information about the application itself. Uh, our calendar this year, we're going to be in Sunapee, as North was mentioning, in just a couple weeks. Um, that's going to be their second shred. And then we're going to be in New Market in October. We're very excited about that. Always room for one more this year if, you know, the stars align. And um, 
not a charrette um, specifically, but or technically, but in the summer, we've started doing a walking tour of a previous charrette community. So last year we were in Franklin. Here's some photos from that tour. And the year before we went to Bristol. And so while we're there, we're um, learning more about what their charrette was all about and seeing um, what they implemented and what their lessons learned were, what they're still working on, um, kind of where they're going from here. And then we usually go to a local establishment for um, you know, a beverage. So we're still working out the details for this year, but it will be in July. Um, and so we'll, we'll send out information about that once it's formalized, if people are interested in seeing a community that's been able to implement a lot of things. Um, and the last thing I want to point out before we do Q&A is, sorry, just our upcoming events. Not sure related necessarily, but um, these are a few of our events in the next couple of months. And in April, our very next event is April 30th, um, and we're going to be having our spring workshop on planning for electric vehicles. Uh, we're going to be hosted at the regional facility that Unitil built in Exeter. Um, so we're really excited about that. We've got folks from North Country Council, City of Dover, um, Green Wave Electric Vehicles, as well as Clean Energy New Hampshire that are going to be presenting on this hot topic for um, communities and planning. And so we're pretty excited about it. Um, all this information is on our website as well. So thank you. Um, I think we can go through the questions and I think not just myself, but we have a few committee members on this call. So I think it would be great if people wanna chime in. Um, just looking. Okay, so one question is, I believe North kind of answered who are the stakeholders. Um, who are the stakeholders relative to the, to the community? Are stakeholders community leaders or do they include citizens without titles? Maybe, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that, North? I know you kind of talked about stakeholders, but it isn't just people with a title. Right, and, and that's, um, that depends on the community. Um, when we're in a place like Manchester, um, it tends to be a little bit more of a formal um, setting where there are titles. Smaller communities um, leverage their citizenry a lot much more. So there might be a, a member of a volunteer board, um, you know, say a conservation um, group that's a nonprofit in and of itself. Uh, those sorts of people that are identified by leadership as being um, critical to uh, providing us the background information we're, we're looking for. Yeah, and we really work with the community. Those, that's um, not invitation only in an exclusive way, but invitation in the sense that we want to make sure certain people are at that uh, meeting. And so we work with the community to help them think through who that might be um, so that they have a broad idea of who stakeholders are and really are thinking about all the people who maybe should be invited. Um, it could range from like RPC representative to a, a property owner that abuts the target area. Um, and one of the reasons I'm gonna say, but someone else chime in if you want. Um, one of the reasons I, I would say that we separate that from the public input sessions is so that um, all of the technical information that sometimes stakeholders have doesn't bog down public input. Like during the input session, we really want people to feel free to think, just think wildly. Like what do they want in their community? What do they want in the future? And we don't necessarily want that to be squashed <laughs> by someone who who knows more about the current regulations or things like that. You know, for most of these things, for many of these things to be implemented, there might be regulatory change or other things the community has to figure out. Um, and we want to make sure that public input session can be really like creative and open minded. Um, a lot of times stakeholders return and they they participate as a resident in the public stakeholder session. Can you so here's a question. Can you tell me about recruiting participants from the community? How well are different constituent groups represented? Um, and actually, I hate to keep calling on you, North, but we were just in Manchester, which had a very interesting, I think, challenge with just being a really diverse neighborhood that we were working in. And do you want to speak a little bit to how, what our relationship is to that, and then just what the 
the host was CLF, which is the Conservation Law Foundation, but kind of their take on how they got people to the to the sessions. Well, CLF um, has a boots on the ground um, uh, person in Manchester who was really instrumental in getting the word out. Um, a lot of people in that particular area were kind of distrustful of a process that might be a government led or a landlord led one. They don't feel like they have a voice. So uh, Arnold, um, who was the boots on the ground, would even go to the level of sort of knocking on the door and doors and talk to the people that he has come to know over the years to really get them um, get them feeling like they could um, be in a place where they can have uh, input and they'll be listened to. So that's kind of an extreme um, case. In other cases, it's um, you know uh, people who really were active in the application going to the to the transfer station on a Saturday and making sure that everybody who's dropping their trash off know what's happening. Yeah. Libraries, grocery stores, uh, social media, and so forth. Yeah, and even in Manchester, as Norris said, it's kind of a, maybe a unique case, but there were even, we had translators um, at the session. So we had a table all communicating in Arabic, for example. Um, that responsibility is on the host community who really knows their community, but we are always here. We have conversations to try and like think through and strategize about how to ensure the best turnout possible because we're kind of a more the merrier philosophy, um, including the naysayers, you know. <laughs> um, you definitely don't want to exclude the naysayers because that can work against you. Um, in terms of pre charette preparations, um, Brian or Jamie, do either of you want to jump in on this? What what kind of like promotion, information gathering, local zoning, like what do we do pre charette to prepare? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer that. Um, so as a leader, we um, we you know we receive the application. We have a pre application meeting with the stakeholders, kind of understand um, what their application asks for, and then we help them uh, develop some base maps to make sure that, you know, visually we have everything that we need. Um, and then we build the team. So we, again, we go through the application with the town, figure out specific, like, you know, what uh, professionals would be needed, uh, you know, landscape architects, architects, planners, housing people, that sort of stuff. And then we kind of brainstorm together to build the team. Um, he said, it's all volunteers. Um, and yeah, as you know, as it gets closer, we kind of have a pre-application meeting, like with all the volunteers, to just to bring them up to speed a little bit. But as North mentioned earlier, we really don't want them to have any preconceived notions. We want to go in, hear it live. So uh, the preps, are, the preparations, really just making sure we know who needs housing, who has dietary restrictions, building the team, getting the base maps, and helping the community uh, market the event because we really want it to be successful. We really want as many people uh, to be there. We want all uh, citizens represented, the stakeholders, the public, everybody. You know, this tournament at the end, we really lean into the community to help promote it. I mean, we obviously promote it through our channels, but I don't expect everyone to be following the planning amateurs email or, mm -hmm. or you know, social media. Um, so, you know, sometimes it goes out in utility bills, water bills, um, the local newspaper, uh, Facebook groups, all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, we try to help give them what they need. Um, um, and then we follow up with them over the course of, um, you know, over the course of the process of, of what the response they're getting. And, and then we, we generally, uh, you know, they'll do like signups or something, right. So we can kind of gauge how many people to expect. Yeah. And every, some communities have like something unique they decide to do that really works for them. So when we were in Kensington, um, one of the things they did is they had a teacher, a local teacher who was just pretty enthusiastic about the process. And she got her elementary school students to, before the charrette, they created drawings of like what they wanted their community to be like, um, just artistic drawings. And then during the charrette, those were all on display. And they felt like it was, you know, just a way to help generate more interest and awareness that this was going to happen, but also a way that they were able to get a little bit more of like the young families involved. Sometimes that's a market that's hard to 
get out of the house <laughs> when they got to be defrosting those chicken nuggets or whatever they're doing. Um, so I thought that was really interesting and unique. And the drawings are, are very cute too. <laughs> I think someone wanted a cat store. Um, but just, to, you know, thinking creatively about how to do something that's just maybe unique to your community can really help get the word out. Um, Leslie asked about keyboard warriors. Does anyone else have keyboard warriors in town who stir things up and spread falsehoods on Facebook, but don't speak up at public forums? <sighs> yes, probably. I'm going to say yes for all of us. But <laughs> um, I know that when we were in, well, maybe, I don't know, we were in a community, I'll say, where they had two Facebook groups, the productive Facebook group and the conspiracy Facebook group. Um, and that conspiracy Facebook group generated a lot of participation at the charrette that we had. And, you know, in the end, it was good. It was more voices. It was more people. Um, it, it didn't bog the process down. You know, it's kind of hard to come out and um, disrupt a charrette in the same way a community meeting might be able to be disrupted. Um, so I feel like it actually worked to their benefit. Um, we also were able to clarify some things that that group felt was happening, like which was that there were exclusive meetings happening that people weren't invited to, or just different things that had spread on that group um, about who plan is or who was funding this. And so we were also able just to air that all out. Um, hopefully that helped them, but yeah. So I think that does happen in a lot of communities. I don't think that has to mean, you. oh, Brian, I see you unmuting, so. <laughs> Um, no, I think you covered it pretty well. We did, um, you know, have to, like you said, that community people were, um, you know, opposed to basically any changes. So when they came, they did speak out and, and at the end, after our report, they said, you didn't record, you know, recognize our wishes. And, and I said, well, we did, your wishes were, you didn't want anything to change. And there was one slide that we recognized that there was a constituent of people that wanted everything to stay exactly the same. So we, you know, we listen, we try to get feedback from everyone. Um, but it's really hard to draw recommendations that say do nothing other than one slide. <laughs> I'm looking at the questions. Um, is there support for lower resource communities to identify and apply for these grants? Um, and how close to capacity is Plan New Hampshire um, in a given year? So I think I probably, maybe I said it after you asked this question, Devin, but we could, we do two to three a year. We've talked about four, um, but it does take a lot on the back end and our volunteer network's only so um, available with their time. So that's, I don't know when we'll be able to scale up to four a year. Um, we don't have any grants ourselves, but I do think things like the mini grant, New Hampshire housing is a great option if housing is connected to what the community is looking to do. Um, depending on what the community would be looking to do, we might have some other ideas. Um, so I'd be happy to connect um, offline. And in terms of requests, how many requests do we get a year? Um, it's funny because I think a lot of times people contact us, they don't just send an application, right? So they contact me and they ask some questions. And usually at that time, I'm able to say like, we're already booked. Like in 2023, we were like booked up, you know? Um, so then they kind of put a pause on applying, um, because they've discussed it with me or something. So a lot of the times we're getting a handful of actual applications um, because I just think people end up asking me like, is there space, is there room? But we just encourage anyone to call, talk about it with us to submit an application. Um, our committee, even if you don't have the letters of support right away, our committee will review just to like ask some initial questions maybe, and then look for your letters of support before anything would be official. Um, and to kind of start penciling in, like this community is looking for fall, this community is looking for spring. Um, we really try to make it work uh, if if we can. I don't know if there's, and if anyone wants to like unmute and ask a question, I would love to hear your question, Joseph, if you're still on here from um, Plymouth. Are you on here still? Yeah. Not to put Hi. you on the spot, but. Um, <laughs> no problem. I see Hopefully it and I'd love for you to like ask it with a little more because I'm very interested. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, 
hopefully everyone can hear me fine. My question had to do with, um, has Plan New Hampshire considered combining a charrette with something like a, a pop-up that you see sometimes with, you know, a, a something like a temporary exhibition or display of maybe possible infrastructure changes. So like traffic calming, streetscaping, uh, but just on a small sort of pop-up scale with chalk and cones and planters. Um, you know, I think uh, the town of Bethlehem may have uh, trialed one of these uh, sort of pop-up traffic calming things, but it seems like it, if it's not been integrated, it could be a maybe an interesting thing to integrate into a future charrette. Yeah, that's a great question. This is North Sturdivant again. We've had, um, you know, as part of it is time. You know, there's like a a, a, a real issue with um, how much time we have to listen and to produce our recommendations. That said, it is um, not unusual for us to make recommendations to do that, um, to try some tactical urbanism um, if, if people are unsure that uh, narrowing a, a roadway is going to be effective, or um, you know something along those lines, so we're aware of of those concepts. But the reality is, in two days with volunteers, there's only so much we can get done. Any other questions before we? We let you back to your day, everyone. I hope we've answered everything in the chat. Um, all right. Well, I think we're going to let everyone go. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Brian and Jamie and North um, for chiming in and giving some insight. Um, I'll share the slides out after this, as well as the links and even the video to <laughs> the video with the testimonial. I'm telling you, it's fabulous. <laughs> um, so and thank Tiffany, you all. Your contact information will be there. So yes, if there's some follow up questions. Yep. Um, yeah, if anyone has follow up questions there. about volunteering or applying, please um, do not be shy. So thank you all. Have a great awesome. day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.